2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuous in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Okay, so we all belong to different groups. We have families, we have churches, we have schools, we have friends, we have a nation. We belong to different sorts of groups. And every group has values or ideas that they honor. There are certain ideals that each group has that they value that are important, and these are are held up. So, for example, there's... A lot of families who value people, their, their families living close together so that they can be together often and support one another often. And so this is celebrated, this is complimented, honored, for example. We just heard from Positive Options a little bit ago, and what is valued there obviously is life and mothers who are experiencing unplanned pregnancies choosing life. And so this is celebrated and honored, and this is part of what that group is about. Each group has a system of honor, shame, that encourages behavior consistent with its values. So whatever group that you are a part of, there's certain ideals of that group, and those ideals are being reinforced through different sorts of ways that the group interacts with itself. So, sometimes these are written, sometimes they're unwritten. Sometimes this could be either something as simple as a pat on the back or a medal of honor. Whatever ways the group decides that they want to reinforce good behavior or behavior consistent with its ideals, that's encouraged. And sometimes to discourage certain behavior, there's a sour glance or maybe a jail cell to discourage behavior that is not consistent with the group and its ideals. So, shame, it's often thought to be bad in all cases. But shame is actually kind of like pain, physical pain. Sometimes it's useful, and sometimes it's for no purpose. So pain is unpleasant, but it can be very useful for protecting yourself. So it's a good thing if you were going to if you were going to lean against something that happened to be a hot stove and you didn't realize that, it would be good for you to experience some pain so that you would pull your hand away. Or if you were having a heart attack or something and you were feeling pain, it would be good for you to know that you're having a heart attack and that you can call 911. Or an appendicitis. It's, that's useful to have pain in those circumstances. Then you know that something is wrong and you can address it. So pain is like shame. Sometimes shame is helpful. Sometimes it's without purpose. 
There are two kinds of shame. There's misplaced shame and well-placed shame. And maybe that's self-explanatory, but misplaced shame is feeling shame over what isn't shameful. Some people feel shame about just who they are, and that's misplaced because every person has value. Some people have shame over things that they've done a long time ago that they've sought forgiveness from, and they shouldn't feel shame about that anymore. God has forgiven them, but they still feel bad about it. That's misplaced shame. But some shame is helpful. Some shame is well-placed. Just like some pain is helpful, the well-placed shame is helpful. It's the sense of shame that we all have that made us put on clothes this morning. We have a sense of shame that leads us to, you know, put on clothes and be appropriate. It's a sense of shame that prompts us to act politely to one another in society so that we have a a society that works together or practice good hygiene. It's a sense of shame that promotes us to do these things. And when we do something wrong, which we all do, we all do things that we know better not to do, it's healthy to feel shame when we do something wrong. When we do something wrong and we know better, it's a good thing that we feel ashamed about that. That reminds us that what we did was wrong, we can't just forget about it or sweep it under the rug. We should, we should do something about it. So, If you ditched one friend for another and you feel bad about it, that's appropriate. Because you know better than that. If you say something that you know isn't true and you feel bad about that, that's that's appropriate. That means you have a healthy sense of shame. Or when you betray a confidence and you feel badly about that, that, that's appropriate. Because we should feel shamed about the things that we do that are wrong. Somebody who never feels any shame or guilt at all is actually not a healthy person. We call those people psychopaths. People who can do all kinds of wrong things to others and never feel any guilt or shame about it. There's something wrong with that person. They're called psychopaths. They have no conscience. So if you experience shame... When you do something wrong, that, that's well-placed shame. And that reminds you and tells you that you did something wrong and you need, to, you need to fix it. And that's healthy. Now, for Christians, feeling temporary guilt or shame over a committed sin is healthy. There's some sense of shame that everybody has. You know, when you do things that everybody considers wrong. You know, like lying and, and uh, ditching one friend for another and such, but there are certain things that God says are wrong, that are sins, and He said to us, when you do this, that grieves me. And if you're a Christian, then you will feel not only a healthy sense of shame when you do something that everybody considers wrong, but even when you do something that God considers wrong. So if you take the Lord's name in vain, for example, lots of people do it all the time and don't think twice about it. But if you're, if you're a Christian and you take the Lord's name in vain, you feel shame about that because you know that that grieves the Lord. It says in 2 Corinthians 7, Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So there's good sense of shame that prompts us to repent and to change and to turn from sin. Now ongoing shame over confessed sin that you have confessed before God, God has forgiven you for it, if you're still feeling bad about that, that's misplaced shame. That's not helpful to anybody. But feeling bad about something that you've just done, a temporary sense of shame to prompt you to repent, that's healthy. Now, in Thessalonica here, the passage that we just read, 
Paul is writing to a church there. He had gone there. He had started the church there. He knows these people pretty well. From what we can tell in these letters, they're, they're pretty close to one another. They have, a, they have an affection for one another. And so, Paul is hearing that there are some people in Thessalonica, in the church, people who call themselves Christians who have decided that they're just not going to work. So in Thessalonica, like it says in verse 12 there, there were Christians who refused to work. They just said, I'm not working. It says in verse 12, Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Do, do your own work. This is the Christian thing to do. The word that Paul uses in verses 6 and 11 suggests that these people were unruly. That people have said, you know, you need to work. And they've said, eh, that these people just are not, they have no shame over what they're doing. They're meddling and they're freeloading and they don't think anything of it at all. So this word in military context refers to soldiers who couldn't keep step or follow commands. And it also refers to students or workers who failed to do their work or just didn't follow instructions. Now, I want to throw this out there. There were a lot of times when Paul wrote to churches and said, okay, you guys have these differences here. Just, just get along here. All right? This is not a big deal. Just relax. Whether it's how you observe a Sabbath or circumcision or eating meat that you bought in the marketplace that may or may not have been sold or, or uh, given to an idol or whatever, just get along. All right? But on this... It's not, well, just let these people do whatever they want. You know, just get along. There's not getting along about this. There's some habits and practices where there is no compromise. Diligence is one habit that's distinctive of those who are saved by God's grace. If you've been saved by God's grace, you're not prompted to be lazy or to freeload or to meddle in other people's business. You're prompted to work, to be a good citizen and earn your own living in all quietness and decency and such. So Paul says, this is why when we were with you, we worked hard. And we did that not because, not because you know, we didn't deserve to be compensated for our work, but we wanted to show you that hard work is a good thing. This is a Christian thing to do. We want to give you an example to follow. Our, our, what we preach has to match what we do. And so we wanted to demonstrate to you that regular kind of work is valid. It's good. Earning your own bread to eat is good. We're Christians and ministry, as important as it is, that doesn't mean that we don't have to do any work at all. There's good work to be done. So laziness and meddling must be corrected. As a church, as, as Christians, that we, we got to draw a line there. It says in, in our passage that we just read, we command is used three times here. Not just, this would be a good idea, we suggest this, or have you thought about this? No, we're, we're, we're laying down the law here. We command. This is not a suggestion. We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're pulling rank here. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you. So a believer who refuses to work and is meddling in other people's business, that's a time when there should be some shame. Feeling shame about that would be a healthy thing. It would be beneficial. Verse 14, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. 
Sounds kind of harsh. But when the healthy sense of shame fails, others need to step up. Is basically what that's saying. So, shame is like pain. Let's say, let's say that you were having an appendicitis and you didn't experience pain from that. And you just, there was just this little discomfort, no big deal. Or let's say you were having a heart attack and, you know, maybe your arm was tingly and, you know, some of those, you know, less painful symptoms and that's all you had. And so you think, oh, it's not that big a deal. I'm just going to push through it. It'd be kind of good for somebody around you to be saying to you, um, you're feeling some tingling in your arm? That could be a heart attack. We better, we better call 911 just to be sure. Oh, I can push through it. I'll, I'll be fine. You know, it's, it's probably not. It, I probably, probably just leaned on something wrong. No, you probably need to check that out. It'd be good for somebody else to step in if your system of pain is not working to say, hey, maybe we should do something about that. There's children who need to be set straight in the things that they do. One child might take a toy from his sister because it's mine, and another child might hit the neighbor just because he started it. Well, when you do things like that, you know, those are times that you need to feel some shame. That's, that's wrong to do. How do you think that the other person felt when you did that? That's a, a Deirdre thing a lot with the kids at school. How do you think that that action or those words made the other pe- person feel? What if they said that to you? How would you feel? Children need to be set on course for a healthy sense of shame. So, we have honor and shame, and we have honor and shame in all groups. Whether we acknowledge it or not, it's there. Paul is talking here about a Christian sense of honor and shame within the church. This is how we should be operating as a church. Now, we live in a society right now, it's called Western Civilization or Western Society, Traditionally, our society has focused on the individual and not the group. So we speak to individuals usually, not, not groups as much. We see our identity as individuals and not groups as much. But even though we live in the Western world, Western society is increasingly like an honor-shame culture. More and more, we're seeing honor and shame rather than the individualism. So for example, when we agree with somebody, we honor them. We will compliment them. We will cheer for them. We will hit like on their Facebook posts. We honor them when you agree with somebody. If you disagree with somebody, We don't debate anymore. We don't challenge the idea anymore, or not very often. We attack the person. We shame them. We use ridicule. We use mockery. We use insults. We use personal attacks. We use nasty memes. And especially in the political climate that we're in right now, this is very rampant. We don't debate the ideas anymore. We shame. And what ends up happening is that one group's honor and shame, it doesn't match another group's honor and shame, so people are just shaming each other and nobody's getting anywhere. So this is how the world works. And it's, it's, a, messy, it's a messy place, it's a messy business. So I want to tell you that the honor and shame of the church is very different from the honor and shame that the world uses. There is an honor and shame in the world, but the church's honor and shame works very differently. 
And we need to always remember that. Because if we're going to operate as a church under Christian love, we can't be doing honor and shame like the world does it. There needs to be a distinctive nature of our group using honor and shame. Look at the screen here with me and let's answer this together. What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Church? I believe that the Son of God, through His Spirit and Word, out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, protects, and preserves for Himself a community chosen for eternal life and united in true faith. And of this community, I am and always will be a living member. Okay? So, if you're a believer and you belong to this group of people, what we call a church. A church is not a building. It's a group of people that we belong to. These are the people who have been saved by grace that God has called. And so we act differently than the rest of the world does. The world's honor, shame systems destroy people. It destroys people. There is very little forgiveness out there in the world's honor and shame system. If you cross somebody, if you disagree with somebody, then you are going to be shamed into oblivion. And there is going to be tons of penance to pay for you to atone for your sins. It almost has a religious nature to it. I was reading a story this week about this boy in India. And uh, he fell in love with this girl. And so he wrote this, this girl that he fell in love with, he wrote her a letter. But instead of that letter getting into the hands of this girl, it got into the hands of her father. And the father was very upset about this. I don't know the context of it or why he was upset, but he was very upset about this. So he brought this boy from the town. They brought him like to a town hall meeting. This is what you do in villages in India, I, I suppose. And uh, they reprimanded him and basically shamed him. But it wasn't enough for this father... So afterwards, this father and others in that family took off their sandals. Remember, sandals are attached to your feet. Your feet are the most shameful part of your body. And they slapped this kid with their sandals. And because of that amount of shame, this kid committed suicide. The way that the world uses honor and shame destroys people. And we shame one another in the world's way. We destroy them. The church's honor and shame system, it helps people. It doesn't destroy them. It hurts. So kind of like helpful pain that alerts us to a heart attack or an appendicitis, the church's sense of honor and shame helps people or it's supposed to anyway. It says in verse 15, Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. The world's honor and shame sees enemies, and they see people to destroy. If we're in the church, we need to see one another as brothers and sisters, and we need to seek to rectify that relationship. In the church, we are brothers and sisters who share the same grace in Christ. The same grace that forgave your sins is the same grace that forgives the other person's sins. Your brother or your sister. It's all the same grace. And therefore, we have really nothing to hold over anybody else. We really don't. We're all saved by grace and we all have the same problem of sin. The world's honor and shame is based on pride and vengeance. If your pride has been injured, 
then it's time to take vengeance and the other person must pay for what they've done until the offended person is satisfied. The church's honor and shame is based on God's grace and Christian love. People saved by grace can't look down on anyone else. And so when somebody steps on our toes, somebody crosses us, somebody offends us, which is going to happen because we're human, it's out of concern that we approach it. Not out of envy or hostility or anything like that. James 5. This is how the epistle of James ends, actually. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So if there's somebody who is wandering or straying or in patterns of sin, we need to approach that person with kindness and concern. We've been saved by the same grace. We need to to be concerned about that. Christian correction is thoughtful and gentle. Galatians 6 verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Restore in a spirit of gentleness. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. We, we treat one another differently than the world does. Or we're supposed to, anyway. When we correct somebody, it's got to be out of thoughtfulness and gentleness. Not out of vengeance. Not out of envy. Not out of hostility. Now, God's grace, it doesn't remove all shame in the way that we would become psychopaths who never have any shame or any conscience at all. If you've been saved by grace, it still means that your actions matter. But grace turns misplaced shame into well-placed shame. It gives you relief from the misplaced shame. And it gives you shame in areas that you would need to repent. I'm going to talk more about misplaced shame in a coming message. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that right now. Grace doesn't make sin excusable. Grace turns us from it. It gives us a healthy sense of shame. Parents discipline their children so they grow up, so they mature, so that they make good choices and they manage themselves. Parents are not under an illusion that their child can do no wrong. You correct your children, you shape them into having a healthy sense of shame so they know what's appropriate and what's not. True love includes rebuke of equals and discipline of subordinates. So if you're a parent to a child, you discipline them. And if you are dealing with somebody who is equal to you, you treat them as a brother or as a sister. You still rebuke them. You call them on it. This is how Jesus works, too. Revelation 3.19, Jesus talking. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. We're not supposed to just forget about these things. There are certain things where it's like, okay, there's a line there. This is not how Christians act. We command is used in our passage three times. True, a true church loves enough to correct. A true Christian can both give and receive correction in humility and love. We are all going to have our moments when we're going to step on somebody's toes or stray. 
It says in Psalm 141, Let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. My head will not refuse it. There's a healthy sense of shame that we need. And when our sense of shame fails, somebody else needs to step in, in kindness and love, in all Christian faith, to help. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, as a church, as believers, we want to be different than the world's sense of honor and shame. We want to treat one another differently. Lord, we want to help one another when help is needed. Give us the right words to say, the right times and at the right ways, so that we are treating one another as brothers and sisters, not enemies. And Lord, help us always to build up one another so that we are filled to the fullness of who Jesus Christ is, in whose name we pray. Amen.